Hello and welcome back to the Steel Beast Beginner's Guide. This is going to be part 2 Alpha and I'm going to have a follow-on video which is part 2 Bravo. My original thought process was to cover some topics then go directly into your first mission but that would make this video ridiculously long so I'm going to divide it into two sections so that it's a little bit easier for you the viewer to understand the concepts. Now, what we're going to cover is three things in this video. One is the basics of using the mission editor. Two is using repair, resupply, and medical support assets located in the game and how they work. And third is going over some basics of fire support and how that's implemented in the game itself. To go over the recommended level of proficiency that I stated in the last video, I would recommend that you're able to do the following things before you decide to undertake your first mission. First, for whatever vehicle platform you select, complete all the tutorials for your vehicle. Next, on the tank range, if you can get 80% accuracy with an 8 second engagement time or better every single time, you're good to go there. I'd recommend playing instant action and being able to get about 4-6 to six kills consistently in that. And I'd also recommend that you are comfortable with fighting from the commander station. By comfortable, I specifically mean in regard to the M1A2 SEP, which we're basing this lesson on. One, being able to scan with the commander's independent thermal viewer. Two, being able to properly maneuver your tank and traverse the battlefield. Three, being able to use the CITV to designate targets to your gunner. And four, knowing how to pop smoke from your tank by pressing the tab key. All right, pretty easy stuff. So let's go ahead and get into Steel Beast and go over some of the basics with the mission editor. All right, we're in Steel Beast, and the first mission that we're going to focus on, uh, if you actually go to Offline Session, click here, go to, go to Scenarios, open up Single, you'll see that there's a scenario called Platoon Recon. Reading through the description, you're a platoon of Leopard 2A4s. That's great and all, but we trained on the M1A2, so that's not going to be conducive for our first scenario. Fortunately, with Steel Beast, it comes with a very powerful mission editor, which you can use to quickly edit this mission and change some parameters, and we're going to do that now. Now, with the mission editor, if you just click on it, it'll load up a blank map, and then you'll have to go to open, etc. Uh, so to save time, you can hold down the shift key, left-click on the mission editor, go through here, scenarios and single, there it is, scroll down to platoon recon, and open that. And I will come back once the scenario is loaded into the game. All right, so the scenario has loaded within the mission editor, and you're going to be greeted with a map of the scenario itself that you can look at. By default, it's going to be from the blue party. That's who we're playing as, so that's perfectly fine. To look at the terrain in the 3D world, you can click anywhere on the map and click on View, and after the game loads for a little bit and processes all the textures, you'll be dropped into the game itself uh, where you can look around and see what your view is going to be from looking out of the commander's hatch or looking through it through the uh, gunner's primary sight. Um, as you can see here, it looks like a pretty dark and dismal place with uh, a lot of fog and about, you know, a thousand meters of visibility. So a very easy way to change that, which I am going to do, is to go under here under options, weather, and from here you've got the visual range, which you can change that. Um, I'm going to go with 5,000 meters for this scenario. The reason is, uh, if you look at the furthest point that the player will realistically be able to view, about here, it's about there, it's about four and a half kilometers. So by doing 5,000 meters, the player now in the scenario can see much further, and you're also making sure that you're not cranking it up to something absolutely ridiculous. Let me load that again. Uh, to, you know, like eight, uh, 18,000 meters or something, which the player simply won't be able to take advantage of, and it's more stuff that your computer is going to have to process. So this will help uh, make the game run a little bit smoother if you ensure that the visual range is set to a normal setting. Uh, you can also change, like, some cloud density. So if you change it to clear skies, for example, you can look up, see the effect of that. Um, I'm going to change it back to medium. You know, make it kind of a nice summer day here. Looks, you know, really pleasant, really great, awesome, lovely place to live. Uh, other things that you can do if you're so inclined and, you know, you like a challenge is you can go into the precipitation. You can change this to something like heavy, so there's a heavy rain going on. 
and the world is a very dark, dismal, and dreary place. Additionally, within the game world itself, um, the scenario is going to take into account the precipitation intensity and it will adjust the actual terrain in the world. So, for example, if you start with a heavy precipitation, your vehicles aren't going to have as good of traction and they're also not going to throw up dust trails, which you'll see, hopefully, in the actual game uh, when we get to that portion. All right, changing everything back to normal. There we go. Okay. Uh, a couple of things that I want to do as well with this scenario, it starts with scoring based on how well or poorly you do, and also has a one hour time limit. Since we're going to be playing this for the first time, I don't want you to feel rushed, so change the time limit to none. Go over to scoring here uh, for blue mission score. There's some you know stuff there deciding if you got a major victory, a victory, or a defeat. You're learning. We don't care. Remove all of that. Okay, done. Uh, next, what I want to do is make sure that since we're going to be playing as the U.S. and M1A2s, I want to make sure that we're using the proper textures for the camouflage. So I'm going to open up uh, the Blue Party Camouflage Configuration, select U.S. 2010. That'll give us a very modern camouflage pattern. Click Apply, wait for the game to load, and uh, execute that. And then click OK. And also, I want to have... Uh, U.S. style call signs. Basically, the four element is going to be your platoon sergeant. The one element is going to be your platoon leader. The two element is your senior tanker, etc. An easy way to do that is to go into options, unit call signs, blue. Go into the default one here. Go to import, call sign templates, and then just select the default U.S. one there. You can see how it sets everything to more of a common U.S. call sign template that makes sense to me uh, since I'm familiar with that. Okay, next some of the other options you can do in this game is if you go over to the overlays thing, make sure this is set to all so that you're able to edit it. And uh, these phase lines, you know, I will embarrass myself if I try to pronounce them in actual game, so I'll name them boring old English words that are easy for a knuckle dragger like myself to say. So we'll have phase line axe, Go over here, uh, face line bow, and we're going to do face line claymore. And if your text gets somewhere weird, you can drag it around and put it in a proper position. I'm also going to change these uh, color schemes to black along with uh, black text. And, you know, that's some... Very basic stuff that you can do to just change how the uh, scenario looks and how it plays. Um, to just make it easier for you, either with your localized language or just the type of doctrine you're familiar with or, you know, whatever your background is. Um, for this region here, I'm going to turn that uh, black as well. And we're going to turn the text. I'm going to decrease the scale right there so it's smaller, not taking up as much room in the map. Change it to black, and I'll name this something very American, like Assault Position Apache. Yeah, that, that sounds great. With this box here, um, if you look at it and you right-click, it's a deployment zone. So what this means when you have that is that the player, when they load the actual mission, they can, load, they can move uh, any blue forces that start within this square to any point in that square. They can change position, they can change formation. They can do all the stuff they need to pre-position their forces before they actually click start and begin the mission. I highly recommend uh, in any scenario to uh, put that in place to just make it easier on yourself. Okay, uh, we've got all of that basic stuff set up. So what I'm going to do now is I'll go over fire support in a little bit, but just for the case of this scenario for you to follow along, go in here, go into support, uh, blue, and I'm going to make sure that we have uh, indirect fire assets. So we've got three batteries, six tubes of artillery per battery, and I'm going to go with unlimited rounds of HE, smoke, and ICM. I'm going to decrease air strikes to zero because I don't really intend to use them. Uh, with who can call for fire, if this is a single player scenario, I recommend for the blue side to always have this on all units and do not allow the AI to call for fire. Otherwise, they will just call fire missions, they'll tie up your guns, and you can't cancel them. 
if this was the red side, having allow AI to call for fire would be a good thing and would be a good way to simulate them calling for fire on your position. Okay, finally, we're going to go ahead and place some blue four units on the map. So to start with, if you look in the game world here, we've got the platoon of three Leopard 2 A4s, which is exactly what we don't want for this mission because we're going to run it with M1 A2 SEPs. So you right click, go to new unit tanks, M1 A2 SEP. Uh, yep, that looks good. Platoon of four. Uh, what you can do from here once they're placed on the map and you know, I'll wait for this to load to show that they are actually M1A2s. Uh, you've got them here, but they're, of course, facing the completely wrong direction from uh, the enemy in their direction of travel. So you could leave it to the player since you've already put it in a deployment zone to, you know, do it themselves. But I think that's kind of silly, and I don't really do that. So a simple way to put them in the direction of travel is go to set tactics stay that's by right clicking on the unit uh, you'll have this little uh, circle here which you can drag as you can see there with the blue outlines it's going to show uh, where they are in formation so i'll put them facing this road to start with go to none for tactics so they'll remain in that position set them in a line formation at close interval and now when you look at the tank platoon it looks a bit more organized and ready for the actual upcoming operation. A few other things that I'd recommend doing, especially for your first mission, is you can go into the tank platoon itself. Um, you can add mine plows and rollers. I wouldn't do that unless you have a need for it. Uh, you can add in uh, optical sights for your 50 cal. I'm going to do the Spectre 3.4, which adds that little guy to your 50 cal. It just makes it a little bit easier to use if you're trying to use that as opposed to using the iron sights. Plus it gives you a little bit of uh, magnification. I would also recommend turning on the AVEPS active protection system. The Abrams doesn't actually have this in real life, but what this is going to do is make your vehicles much more survivable. And when you're learning Steel Beast, you are going to get punched in the nose by the opposing force very often and quite hard. So any advantage that you can get uh, is going to simply make it so, one, you're having more fun learning the game, and two, your introduction to you uh, not making the correct tactical decision isn't your entire platoon dying within the span of a minute and 30 seconds, which is a very, very real possibility in modern armored warfare. Okay, some uh, other stuff that I'm going to add for the scenario is you can put in artillery. I'm going to do the uh, M1064 uh, Alpha 3. These are mortar carrier vehicles. I'm going to set them in this direction. This will allow you to have mortar fire when you actually play the mission itself, which I think is beneficial uh, to learn how to integrate both fire as well as maneuver. Uh, and we're going to give them, if I go under here, a... Uh, let me see if I can call it. Yep. A Hemet supply truck, which is going to be able to resupply uh, that mortar uh, carrier section there. And again, you can always load up the 3D view and look to see how they uh, are in place in the 3D world. So I'll move this probably to about that location there. Change their heading a little bit. Yeah, that looks pretty good. All right, so... At this point, you've done everything that you need to do to set up the first scenario within the mission editor. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and save that here. And to do that, very simply, file, save as, and under my scenarios, I'm going to call this Platoon Recon to Bravo. That's going to be the next video where we actually play it. With that being said, I'm going to take some time and set up uh, some demonstrations of what I call the sustainment warfighting function, which is going to consist of repair assets, resupply assets, as well as medical support, and I'll go over some very basics of fire support and its use in game. So I'll do a cut here and come back when I've got everything set up. 
All right, so I've come across this Humvee that, uh, when I was looking at it, first off, they were completely out of ammunition for their Mark 19 grenade launcher. Additionally, it's kind of weird because it appears that uh, this vehicle has the gunner and the driver both knocked out of action. It also has some uh, damages going on with it with the wheels. I'm not really sure what happened there. I can only imagine what sort of valorous action they were in prior to this. But that is a great segue to get into talking about repair, resupply, and medical assets within Steel Beast. So to start with, uh, for this individual vehicle itself, if you'll look over here, you can of course see the general damages. Now, some of the damages can be repaired by the crew, in this case left, the left wheels as well as the right wheels on the vehicle. And you'll see a little timer there saying 1945 and slowly slowly decreasing. And what this simulates is the crew physically getting out, replacing the tires, or in a, some other way, you know, being able to fix them. That is done at the operator level, and there's no input required from you, minus just giving them 19 minutes plus, you know, what it says there, uh, without moving, engaging in combat, or anything else. They just need to be sitting there. Now, you'll have some other damages that can occur, such as, say, engine or something of that nature, which will not have a timer on that. That means you'll need to bring them to some repair assets. Now, the gunner and driver function in a similar manner. So in this case, we've got to actually bring them to a location where they can be treated by the medics and basically either be patched up or the casualties are taken away and new personnel are put in to fill those positions. But in this case, as you can see, the driver's out of action, so they can't actually move anywhere. So fortunately for us, uh, we've got another Humvee that happens to be nearby who's going to go ahead and tow them to safety. And I'll show you how to do that as soon as they get to this location here. All right, so the Humvee's arrived. I'm going to go ahead and back them in uh, to make it a little bit easier to tow. Uh, you normally want to hook up the vehicle that is being towed to the rear so that they're able to drive forward and it makes it fairly simple. Now, in order to tow the vehicle, the easiest way to do this is, go, is to go to the uh, external view by pressing F8 if you're not already there. I'm going to go down to the vehicle itself, which is 44 Alpha. Left click on the vehicle and there's the option for tow vehicle. You'll click that, you'll get this little cursor here, and you'll place it over the vehicle in question that you want to tow, which is 41. Here it'll say hitching vehicle. Um, you can wait for it to get done, or alternatively, what I've found to be useful is you can give the towing vehicle a march command, and once the vehicle is hooked up, they will automatically embark on that process. So I'll go ahead and speed this up with time compression, and you can see that now. So as you can see, they hooked up the vehicle. They're now towing it to this location where there happens to be a supply truck. So that's one part of the puzzle that's going on here. So they'll be able to get um, more ammunition for their Mark 19 grenade launcher. And we'll wait till they get to the point. At this point, uh, they are in the position. We're going to select unhitch. The vehicle will start unhitching what it is towing there. And you can give them another command, you know, some march, and have them move back into another position uh, and as soon as the vehicle is unhitched they'll automatically execute. I'll do some time compression and show you that real quick that it actually does work. And vehicles unhitched and they're leaving. So with the vehicle itself, uh, select them right there. So in their current position if you go into the vehicle uh, you should see at the bottom that they are going to be reloading and yes it says resupplying so Gradually, over time, their station is going to be resupplied with ammunition, and it just takes time. But while they're here, we might as well ensure that their gunner, as well as their driver, is brought back into action. To do that, we'll take a medical vehicle, bring them into the general location. We can click here, kind of do time compression, see them moving towards the vehicle itself. They'll move there, get into position, and... Uh, a way that you can make sure that they are in range is we'll speed this up and you can see that the gunner as well as the driver are now going to be put back into action after that amount of time elapses. Uh, this is important to note because realistically with this vehicle here in about 16 minutes this vehicle which was completely inoperable 
is going to be placed back into the fight, and you can actually use it to move forward and uh, assist with whatever you need it to. Now, if this vehicle had some sort of component, such as an engine or something else, which it was unable to repair on itself, you can get a repair vehicle. In this case, I'm using an M88 Alpha 1. Move it forward to the vehicle itself. They'll set up, and they could start repairing it. And we'll go ahead and go there. Now, it's worth noting that since the crew can already repair the vehicle's uh, damages there, the M88 will not speed up the time. But if it happened to have something like a destroyed engine, the M88, uh, or any other repair vehicle designated in Steel Beast, will be able to repair it. I'll post a link below to the Steel Beast wiki that shows some of the various support vehicles so you can understand what does what in any scenario in game. Alright, let's talk about something slightly more exciting, which is fire support. Fire support in the case of Steel Beast refers to calling for indirect fire. That is to say that the shooter of the mission cannot physically see the target, but is relying on an observer to relay that data back to him. In the case of this Steel Beast scenario, this is going to be focused on uh, two different assets. One is field artillery, which is simulated off-map, and uh, basically that's your M109 Paladin or equivalent. Um, the other that we're looking at is the uh, M1064, or just mortars in this case. Um, this is, of course, modeled in Steel Beast as the 1064 as specified previously. And uh, with both of these... We're going to go over the very basics of fire support. I'm not going to be going over what priority targets in game do, uh, how to employ scatterable fast cam minefields, how to properly adjust for fire or anything of that nature. This is just uh, a very basic overview designed to get you, the new player, able to sling some indirect fire at an enemy position in order to produce effects that you want. Now. Starting off with uh, field artillery, you're looking at about a 2 minute and 45 time uh, from when you call the fire mission itself to when it splashes. Uh, to give you an example of how you call a fire mission, you'll right click somewhere right on the coordinates, you'll go to new artillery call, and I'll select HE, I'll go over the rounds in a minute. Once this is up, you can go into the call for fire portion here. Uh, there are different types of missions. Uh, fire for effect is usually the default one that you're going to use, and that'll work out fine for you. There is the actual location. This is, of course, showing the map. If you put something like a target reference point, uh, let's say, like, call this TRP-1, uh, you can actually, once we place it there and reopen it, you can go into the location and select um, the specific target reference point or other thing that you put on the map. Uh, length and width, this adjusts, of course, how far, uh, as far as the box, you're going to be shooting indirect fires. The default 200 by 200 is fine. In most cases, it gives you a box similar to that shown on the map. Um, other things that I'd like to discuss is the method of control. So there are three primary methods of control for your fire mission. Uh, the first is fire when ready. What this means is as soon as you request a fire mission, when the battery is ready to shoot it, again, about 2 minutes and 45 seconds after requesting it, they'll immediately fire. At my command, um, holds it to where the battery gets set on target and ready to fire, and once it's ready, you can go on to support. It'll say uh, on call, as these cases are, and as soon as I click send for fire for effect, it'll fire the first fire mission. I'm not going to do that quite yet. Uh, the final one that we're looking at is time on target, where you can give the hours, minutes, and seconds in game time that you want it to fire. I've uh, played Steel Beast for eight years, and I've never actually used this method of control, but where I could see it coming in handy is, say, for example, you're in a defensive mission, and the briefing gives you uh, some sort of cue, like you'll defend at battle position Alpha 1 Alpha, for 30 minutes and then displaced your alternate battle position which is Alpha 1 Bravo for example. You could in place a uh, fire mission, do time on target, automatically set it to 30 minutes of in-game time, Just scroll down here and click in 30, click in send and then as soon as that time frame is up the guns will automatically fire um, at that specific time. So it can be useful, I just haven't really used it in the past. Alright, so as you saw previously when editing 
this mission in the mission editor, um, there were three total batteries. Now, I'll talk briefly about what a battery is and what it does in practical game terms. So, a battery simulates one, the actual six tubes of field artillery, in this case we'll say they're one, uh, excuse me, M109 Paladins. Uh, it also simulates other portions, such as your actual ammunition carrying vehicles, uh, any sustainment or support assets they have available to make sure the battery can continue to operate, etc. But it also includes a fire direction center, or an FDC. I don't want to get too into the weeds, but this is um, used at the battery level to really take the information from the observer and translate it to a uh, distance and direction for the guns, as well as giving them all this other field artillery data that I'm not going to talk about in this video. So what this means is that for each battery that you have, that is one fire mission from uh, your uh, field artillery that can be processed. So to give you an example, I've already called in three separate missions here on call. All of them can be fired. All of them have a separate battery's uh, fire direction center controlling them. Now, if I wanted to call in another fire mission, let's say HE, and click send, it'll give you the dreaded waiting for approval message. Now, what waiting for approval means is it's really one of the following. Uh, First off, it means simply that your uh, indirect fire assets are out of ammunition. And you can go into call for fire, and it'll give you the amount of off-map ammunition that is available. If you're checking for the mortars themselves that are on map, you simply click on the unit. It'll display um, their ammunition count up in the upper right-hand corner. So that's the first way to diagnose if it's that problem. Um, if you're out of ammunition, then you obviously can't shoot a fire mission until you get more ammunition. Uh, the second is it's out of range. This is going to apply much more to your mortars, which uh, these particular M1064s have a maximum effective range of 7.2 kilometers. So uh, to put it simply, that's 24, that's 20, that's 4 kilometers, 5, 6, 7. So if I was, for example, trying to call a fire mission on a target located out here outside of our area of operations from the mortars they would be unable to fire until I move them within 7.2 kilometers and then they could execute their fire mission. The other two reasons that you'll get waiting for approval is that all FDCs are working on current fire missions which is of course the case here. Uh, the other one is that all guns are tied up on current fire missions which is also the case. We've got six guns on each requested fire mission. So once we fire one of these fire missions and it is completed, that fire mission would then uh, begin to be calculated and uh, would execute um, at that time. So that gives you a bit of an idea for if you see waiting for approval, how to try to troubleshoot uh, what the issue is. Another thing to mention as well with the fire direction centers and with batteries, you can't cheese this, for example, by saying that, oh, I've got six guns per battery, so I can do, as opposed to three fire missions of six guns, six fire missions of three guns. It doesn't work like that because you're limited by your FDC. Um, on the other hand, you could, for example, have one fire mission where you're using 12 guns, and then another fire mission where you're, you're, where, excuse me, you're using six guns, but you cannot have it where you're using uh, you know, another fire mission past that, if that makes sense. Bottom line, one, fire, one battery equals one fire mission, uh, unless you start changing the tubes. Okay, at this point we're going to showcase the three types of ammunition that you can use for indirect fire. We'll start with high explosive. I'll go ahead and call that in. I'll cancel this mission. So while we're waiting for it, um, I'll both explain what the round does and how I generally use it, as well as show what it actually looks like in game. So high explosive or HE rounds are good for killing light-skinned vehicles and infantry. Um, you can use them against tanks or personnel carriers. They're not going to do um, as much damage as something like ICM, which I'll cover in a minute, but uh, it will... Uh, really force the enemy to displace. So it's very good for creating an effect where if you're moving on to a position where the enemy is in a position of strength, 
you can call an indirect fire mission on him and force his formation to move. Otherwise, he'll just sit there and take rounds. And this is what high explosive rounds look like. Pretty standard stuff. Uh, nothing really exceptionally fantastic about them besides the uh, use of creating effects on the battlefield. This is really the most versatile round and the one that you're going to use probably about 70 to 80 percent of the time in most of your Steel Beast games. All right, seen that, I'll go ahead and end the fire mission by going to support, clicking on the active fire mission, and going to end mission. And that completes that. All right, the next fire mission, uh, excuse me, the next ammunition uh, for fire missions I'm going to talk about is smoke. Now, smoke rounds, as it sounds like, deploys canisters that unleash uh, smoke onto the battlefield. As you can imagine, this uh, prevents the enemy from establishing visual contact. It also blocks your forces from having visual contact. What's interesting, though, is thermal systems, such as what you'll find on your gunner and commander's position in the M1A2, can see through smoke. So uh, what this will do is it will really put you in a position to where if you're facing an enemy who does not have thermals, you'll be in a position of strength. Um, it's also good as well to employ against uh, infantry observation posts or uh, uh, forward observer teams to really prevent them from seeing your forces. And you can see the smoke coming down the battlefield. It's worth mentioning that the billowing smoke is canisters. The type that's flowing in like that there is actually uh, white phosphorus. In game, the white phosphorus is not modeled as far as its effects on thermals. So, as you can see here, you can clearly see through the smoke. Um, in the real world, white phosphorus creates a thermal signature, and you physically can't see through it. So, something to note uh, with Steel Beast, it's uh, not exactly accurate to real life. And I'll go ahead and cancel that. Now, the final type of rounds that we're going to talk about are ICM. This is, uh, these are really sub-munitions containing explosively formed penetrators, and ICM is absolutely deadly at killing any sort of vehicle. So, ICM is normally extremely powerful, so you're going to have a limited number, uh, generally in missions, based on, two how complex of a round and how uh, generally expensive it is to produce as compared to something like a smoke canister or high explosive. I'll go ahead and call that fire mission in. So with ICM you'll see what basically is occurring with this is the sub is the munition is flying in, it's exploding, sub munitions are scattering, and uh, this is absolutely devastating against any sort of vehicles within Steel Beast itself. Um, if you were to call this, for example, on an enemy tank platoon of, say, three T-80s, you would probably kill every single T-80 with uh, one single fire mission. It is that effective. So ICM is very good, especially when the enemy has a massed formation. Uh, you can call an ICM and attrit their forces in a uh, very easy manner um, with not a lot of risk to yourself. So definitely good. Um, the final sort of ammunition mix that I'll talk about with indirect fire as far as uh, field artillery is HE smoke mix. I'm not going to show this. It is legitimately high explosive rounds mixed with smoke. This creates both a suppression effect with the high explosive as well as an obscuration effect with the smoke. So when you're looking to really displace the enemy from a position and prevent them from seeing uh, you maneuvering on them, that is a combination that you can use. All right, I'm going to go ahead and talk about mortars. Um, as mentioned before, uh, the heavy mortars here in the uh, 1064, which are 120 millimeter mortars, have a 7.2 kilometer range. Um, for the sake of this scenario, they can range the entirety of it within the area of operations that you'll be operating. I do, however, recommend moving them forward. Um, I like to have my mortars um, about really five kilometers off of where I plan on calling my furthest fire mission at. That way it gives you about two and a half, or excuse me, 2.2 kilometers extra room to play with. And uh, it just makes it better if the unexpected happens, which 
happens all the time in Steel Beast. Uh, mortars have an extremely quick response time. I'll go ahead and demonstrate that. Uh, go here with New Arty Call. I'll do Smoke Mortar, uh, and I'll do at my command to make sure that we're doing that properly. And, uh, yeah, in this case, uh, these mortars are basically ready to fire with their smoke rounds in about, you know, 20 seconds to get on target. You'll look at, I don't know, maybe 20 to 30 seconds additional. Uh, you're looking at about a minute planning time. So mortars are very good against infantry or providing quick suppression. Mortars are very reactive, and if you have them, don't be deterred by the fact that, fi that field artillery is generally going to do more damage. I find that mortars are exceptional at creating battlefield effects such as suppression or forcing the enemy to displace, or if you're just running into stubborn troops, uh, you can use mortars and uh, destroy them while saving your field artillery for further targets. With mortars being on map, it is up to you to resupply them, as opposed to off-map artillery where it's more or less automated based on the round count that you have. You don't really have to worry about moving the ammunition carrying vehicles forward. Now, as discussed previously, I've got a supply truck here, mortar vehicles here. They're within the range of the actual resupply radius, so uh, once they're done firing a mission, as long as they stay stationary, they will have their ammunition resupplied. All right, I'll go ahead and shoot fire mission. This is going to be smoke. Now, you'll notice on uh, units in game, they'll automatically reposition into the general direction. Uh, they'll start getting ready. It takes them about, again, you know, 45, 46 seconds or so. Uh, really not a long time in the grand scheme of things. Now, the fire mission's getting prepared. They're lining the guns up, and they will start firing onto the target itself. Now, I've used the multispectral smoke. Uh, to show you the difference between regular smoke, which you saw earlier, and multispectral smoke and its effect on the battlefield. Now, multispectral, as the name sounds, uh, not only works within the normal visual spectrum, what you're seeing here, but within the thermal spectrum as well. So, if your enemy is using thermals, you can employ your mortars with multispectral smoke to ensure that the enemy is not physically able to see your formation. Alright, we've got a splash that means that the rounds are preparing to impact and I'll wait for that to occur okay so there's the smoke I'll go ahead and turn on thermals so as you can see it's creating obscuration in the normal view and you can also see it in thermals so it is very powerful for when you absolutely do not want the enemy to be able to see your movement or alternatively if you want to move into a position of strength drop this right in front of their battle position and, uh, you know, you can imagine the enemy's tanks sitting there, and this is what they see. Meanwhile, your tanks are moving towards them into a position of uh, uh, advantage. Alright, so that's the very basics of fire support in itself. Um, so, for the next scenario, uh, or the next video, I should say, we're going to play through this actual scenario as it exists now. And I'll just talk you guys through how I do it, why I make decisions that I make, etc. Just so you kind of understand. Um, in the meantime, again, if you have any questions about this video or anything else related to Steel Beast, leave a comment below. Uh, I can definitely take those and do take them into consideration when making videos. And bottom line, it'll just help this series become better if uh, you guys have some questions that you want answered. So hey, hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you guys next time.